Welcome to the New Books Network. And welcome to New Books in Drugs, Addiction, and Recovery, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Emily Dufton, and today we're talking to Kevin Sabet. Called the quarterback of the new anti-drug movement, Sabet received his PhD in social policy from the University of Oxford and has worked in drug policy for over two decades. He served as an advisor for three presidential administrations, Pope Francis, and the United Nations, and in 2013, he founded the group he still leads, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, better known as SAM, which opposes cannabis legalization and commercialization. His new book, Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know, was released by Forefront Books earlier this year. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Emily. So I wanted to begin by talking about you. Um, Your career has been littered with superlatives. Uh, Beyond the quarterback quote, you've also been called the prodigy of drug politics, arguably the most influential person in the anti-legalization movement, and also by legalization supporters, one of legalization's, quote, biggest enemies, uh, which really means that you're famous on both sides. Uh, (laughs) So where did this interest come from? What drew you to drug policy in the first place? Well, I mean, it's certainly not something that I I pursued uh, from a young age. I never thought you could really have a career uh, in drug policy, I didn't really know what that was. Um, so I, you know, my sights were set on kind of the typical route of law school, and I was interested in. Um, I've actually always been interested in human rights. I grew up, uh, you know, with the notion of, of you know, universal human rights and all kinds of you know the, those kinds of beliefs, and um, which I hold very dearly to this day. But I, you know, I, I kind of ended up here. A little bit by accident. I mean, um, sort of by accident, but also by design in a weird way, if you could at those at the same time. I got involved sort of in the anti-drug movement as a teenager when I when I saw a lot of my friends have problems with drugs. And I grew up in an affluent neighborhood that liked to sweep these issues under the rug. And that didn't sit right with me. And uh, I felt like those kids, my friends needed a voice and kind of went from there. It's interesting. It is a sort of niche political field, but as a drug historian who looks at federal shifts, I found that the people who are really interested in drugs are really into it. It's it's a it's a rare breed, but we are we are passionate individuals. Uh, so, what got you specifically interested in marijuana policy? Then, when did you form Sam, and why? Yeah, yeah. So I, well, I formed Sam in 2013 after, shortly after I left the Obama administration after serving two years as a senior advisor there. And I had served previously for about a year in the Bush, uh, first Bush term of George W. Bush in 2003. Uh, And even before that in the Clinton administration, when um, the drug czar Barry McCaffrey essentially called me up out of the blue when I was at Berkeley as an undergrad and, and said, hey, I like what you're doing. We were going around to clubs in San Francisco and passing out, um, but, you know, postcards and pamphlets about how ecstasy can re- can kill you uh, during the height of the club drug epidemic in the late 1990s. And, you know, that I, I thought that was just kind of like what you do. You just go to the places where you think people are high risk and you try and educate them. I didn't think it was that interesting, but people kind of thought, wait a minute, you, you're, you're going to, you know, you're 19, you're going to clubs in San Francisco and you're, um, and Washington DC actually. And you're, you're passing out like information and putting on slideshows. You know? uh, <laughs> and, and I just thought, yeah, like, is that what you do as someone who's interested in this issue? And, and I guess it wasn't very common. So it got noticed um, by Alan Leshner, who, who's Nora Volkow's uh, predecessor at NIDA and, and like mm-hmm. I said, Barry McCaffrey. And so I got involved in the White House then. And that 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 was really interesting for me, serving in those three different administrations. And then, you know, I, I served more than two years in the Obama administration. And I felt like, um, you know, I, it w- had become repetitive for me. And um, I, I felt like I, I needed a challenge. I also had a bit of a health scare, kind of a freak health scare uh, that put my life into perspective. I was commuting between Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. every week. So that, that kind of got tiring, mm-hmm. as well as traveling for the administration, which was an honor, um, you know, to speak on behalf of the Obama administration. But I that, that sort of um, novelty wore out uh, after about two and a half years. And I spent, you know, I sort of thought I would go into academia, write books, and kind of go from there. And I spent 2012 working on my first book, which I wrote really quickly, actually, I called Reefer Sanity. 
and a very different process than writing this book, which I know we'll probably get into. But um, I, I wrote it as quickly as I could because I could see the misinformation around on marijuana. There was only so much I could say as a government official, and I, I wanted to be free of that. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, I felt like a, you know, someone leaving a band or something. Uh, you sort of love your your bandmates, and but you wanted to go solo because, uh, you know, you want to kind of express what you want to express without going through you know, a, a censor board of some sort. So I um, wrote that book and sort of traveled around the country for that book. And when that was happening and in that beginning process, um, I ran into my friend Patrick Kennedy, who I had worked with uh, as a congress when he was a congressman on the um, ACA and making sure there was coverage for people with addiction. Uh, and um we just both started talking after the day after the vote in Colorado and Washington that legalized marijuana. And Patrick just was, you know, called me up and he was just incredulous. He couldn't believe that we were doing this as a country. And, and he felt like it was big tobacco all over again, which is a fight. Of course, his dad um, had fought for you know, over five decades. And we just started talking about how, you know, if you were anti legalization, you, you were sort of, anti you know you were kind of anti everything and you were sort of pro incarceration and you were pro you know things that we weren't pro actually and mm -hmm. we said well we got to kind of create a new breed of activists who really care about the health and the science and the big business around this and rate wants to raise awareness on this uh, rather than you know maybe some of the arguments that had been used in the past um, that were quickly becoming unsuccessful and um <laughs> Basically, he said, you know, I'm going to be in Colorado uh, right after the new year in 2013, and I'm, I'm going to be there at Sibeli of the Beast. Let, let's launch this idea we've been talking about for a few months. And I, you know, I mean, it was the most disorganized thing you could imagine in terms of trying to get something together, like over literally over the Christmas holidays that was going to start a new organization. We had no legal documents. We hadn't vetted this with anybody. We were just kind of you know, flying by the seat of our pants in a sense, but we knew we, we knew what the arguments were. We knew what we wanted to say. And we thought a few people would show up. We had a little event at the Denver press club. Uh, and instead, you know, you had the marijuana policy project protested outside. We had associated press. We had uh, Reuters, every, every news network basically showed up for this. And that, that changed my life in a sense, because it, it brought me to the journey that I'm still on today with Sam. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, quite a ride in the beginning. Eight years later. Yeah. You're still going, yeah. you're still going on. Wasn't it project Sam in the beginning? Yeah, it was project Sam because I saw this as a little project. <laughs> I saw this as, <laughs> We're going to raise some awareness and no one's going to probably know who we are. And you know, I underestimated the last name. Kennedy is really, I, I didn't grow up with, with JFK or RFK. I grew, you know, I was born when when, you know, Teddy Kennedy was just getting about to have a pretty unsuccessful run for presidency, and he already did a couple years before. I mean, it was, I was not, I, I just, yeah, I'm from the West Coast, where that name carries far, uh, you know, less cachet than the East Coast. And so I, I just, I mean, I, you know, yes, he was a Kennedy, that's important, obviously. Um, and, but I, I think I underestimated that. And, uh, you know, we had no funding. We didn't go to foundations or individuals and get funding to start this. We just thought, you know, I will kind of do this on the side. We're, we're both busy. I was busy writing. I was, frankly, looking for a full-time job, figuring out what I was going to do next. Uh, I was busy giving talks about really all drugs, not just marijuana. And, uh, you know, it, was, it did start out as a little project. And, now it's, and then a couple years later, you know, few million dollar budget and a lot more exposure. It was like, maybe we're not a little project anymore. <laughs> so we've changed our name. <laughs> and hence the name. I, I, was, I always wondered about that. I'm so happy that I now know why project got dropped from Sam. Now it's just Sam. So you said that uh, Smokescreen is not your first book. So tell me a little bit about writing this, this tome and how you approach this project uh, and how that was different from your first. Yeah, well, I mean, as you know very well, I mean, writing a book uh, is not easy, and I certainly wasn't sort of looking to write another book. I, I had written Reefer Sanity rather quickly. I sort of was happy that was done. I had updated it, you know, for a small press in New York as a second edition, and I was happy about that. But that, you know, that that was that was it. I thought, well, I'll just I'll just update it every couple of years with the latest science because it, you know, Reefer Sanity was seven great myths about marijuana and I, I would go through each of the myths and 
you know, it's kind of a nice organization, a nice way to do it. And then I started getting, you know, through my travels and people I was talking to, I started getting approached by people within the marijuana industry, for example, people who had invested in the marijuana industry or who were working there, uh, you know, in a dispensary or something, and also by state employees who, and former state employees who essentially told me, hey, there's some stuff no one really wants to look into and journalists don't seem to really care about it because they're just writing about how great marijuana is. And, um, you know, I certainly, you know, we have to be careful politically, but there are some issues going on. You should take a closer look at our state. And that happened in Colorado, uh, for example. And, um, you know, it's funny because even today I got an email from a, from a marijuana employee who said, you know, I can't believe I'm writing Kevin Sabet, but I need to tell you what's going on and the malfeasance that's happening. And, I I said to myself, well, this is a story that that we need to tell. And when I started digging more into some of the big marijuana companies and, you know, just sort of where they were getting their funding, what they were doing with their funding, um, you know, their background. And uh, I was just it, it was clear to me that there was another book here. But it th- this was several years in the making. This was um, really a labor of love. I, I you know, just interviewed many different people, unlike Reefer Sanity, again, that I sort of compiled statistics. I didn't want to just write a book about statistics. I wanted to write a book about stories and the stories I'm hearing from people, as well as stories of addiction and stories of people um, having problems with, for example, you know, medical marijuana, being prescribed medical marijuana by a top doctor in New York as a 16-year-old girl. And, you know, hearing what that did to her, uh, what that did to her mental, mental health, mental state of mind. And, um, you know, all of these things were important. And I, I felt there was another book there. So that, that's what that's why I started to write it. So who is your intended audience for Smokescreen and and what are you trying to get across to them? Well, I think my I've tried to be consistent with my intended audience throughout the media, you know, that I employ, whether it's writing an op-ed or a book. Uh, and I'm really trying to talk to the majority of Americans who I don't think have a really strong point of view on this issue. Uh, they don't know much about marijuana other than they probably tried it a few times, didn't really like it. Cause of course the vast majority of people who try marijuana, you know, sort of give up after one or two times. They don't really like it. Uh, and kind of who see this issue, you know, it's sort of a sexy issue that is on the news every now and again, and, uh, you know, might tune in, but really they don't grasp the, the big issues with it. And so one, one of my audience is always that audience. It's that I think 60 to 70% of Americans who do not have strong views either way and sort of passively go along with legalization or without, or, or against legalization. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to write it for them. Uh, I also wanted to write it for who I think are really victims the victims of this industry who um, they want their story told. I mean, and they told me that, I mean, they, you know, and for parents that are going through this um, with their kids, you know, that they're not alone, that they, that this is something that is happening around the country and, and we have to raise awareness uh, about it. Um, and of course, always decision makers. I, I um, you know, to me, it's important that decision makers who, you know, are trying to follow this issue, uh, really have the facts because actually with the majority of lawmakers out there that I've talked to, even those that have voted in favor of legalization, various you know, legalization bills, they don't really know a lot about this issue. And unless you're maybe five or six members of Congress that have a very special affinity, and, and by the way, on both sides of the aisle uh, for marijuana or five or six that really, really hate marijuana and talk about how they hate it. Um, the ma- vast majority of members of Congress, this is actually a pesky issue. It's not something they want to focus on there, but they are thirsty for information in an easy to read, you know, sort of format and kind of organized. Uh, and I thought this would be helpful for them too. Yeah. The, the book is full of some pretty grim images. Uh, you open with a five-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl, brother and sister, uh, being forced to trim marijuana leaves in a windowless basement for hours at a stretch. Uh, you talk to a lot of parents who are begging you to save their kids. Why did you want to share these stories? You know, I don't think those stories are being told uh, in, in, you know, to the vast majority of folks in this country or really around the world. I, I, I think there are stories that are hidden for an, a, a lot of reasons. I mean, I'm not just like saying that there's a 
you know, conspiracy to hide all of this. But, uh, you know, I, I just don't read these stories that often and I don't see them out there. And I thought that they, it was time to tell these stories so that more stories could be told. And, you know, since I've written the book, I've gotten so many responses and emails from parents uh, saying, you know, this is exactly my perspective or one ending tragedy. Uh, it's actually interesting. I, I got a news alert um, two days ago saying, you know, my book would be discussed at a town meeting and there's going to be a presentation. And I, I sort of scrambled uh, at my calendar and I, I talked to my assistant and my staff. I said, well, wait a minute. I don't know about this. I, I, I'm not supposed to be in Connecticut. You know, what's going on? <laughs> and uh, so uh, they, they were like, I don't know. So I, I had figured that maybe I had just dropped the ball, uh, which is not very uncommon. I had forgotten, you know, on a, an email I'd gotten or something. So I actually just out of the blue emailed. It was a it was a woman who had a very small organization called A Promise to Jordan in Connecticut, and I emailed her and I said, "Hey, I'm really sorry if I you know sort of this isn't on my calendar, but can you refresh my memory? Like sort of kind of ha half pretending that I sort of knew you know sort of knew her. But I was like, I, I can't find my email right now on this. Can you can you fill me in again and let me know what what's happening and and she responded right away and said, oh, I hope it wasn't inappropriate. I, we hadn't you know, contacted you. We're just having a book discussion on this uh, because my son um, died of an overdose. We found him in our van slumped over um, and it all started with marijuana when he was 15. And a few years, a few years later, we're, he's in the van and he's dead. Uh, and uh, it started with high potency marijuana and, and your book touched me and we're sharing it here in the community. And I mean, that was just two days ago. And, and I, the, those kinds of stories uh, are coming, you know, all the time. In fact, ironically, and I, and I sort of hesitated to share this with her as, as a woman who, who lost a child, because that's something I can't, you know, I just as a parent myself, could, I, I, I can't pretend to imagine what that feels like. Um, you know, it was interesting because I told her, I said, you know, if you if, if I can say this, uh, I hope it's okay. One of our interns uh, who... Uh, started marijuana at 15 and was going down this path who thankfully is now in recovery and now is interning for us at Sam. His name is Jordan and he happens to be from Connecticut as well. Mm. And it was just kind of a grim, interesting coincidence. Um, but interestingly, this this Jordan who who works for us and also works on Capitol Hill for a Democrat, uh, Democratic senator, he, uh, you know, I met him at a restaurant with his mom a couple of years ago and in, in New York down, down the street from where I live in the West Village. And, you know, I just remember him challenging everything my book had to say and just having a calm conversation with him that wasn't, you know, I wasn't responding sort of defensively. I was just saying, listen, you should research this for yourself. This is what I, how I interpret the science. And basically a year later or so, he turned around and said, you know what, I did research it. You're right. I, I was kind of a fool to sort of question you, but I was, I was reading what I read on Reddit every day about marijuana or what I read on other websites. And um, my generation is, is fooled about this. And I don't know, I think that just tells a couple of stories right there about uh, that are emblematic of the kind of folks I talk to on a regular basis and, and kind of what I'm um, up against in some ways. So it's pretty incredible that you are this kind of the touchstone, the, the face of the anti-legalization movement. You have people coming to you, telling you, hey, you know, I didn't say this, but look under the rug over there. And these are the stories of my family. How does that feel? How does that feel to be the, the face of the anti-legalization movement? That's a, no one's asked me that before, <laughs> interestingly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, in some respect, it feels good because I feel like people trust me with you know, very intimate stories and, and, and very uh, emotional experiences that they've had. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I am not in recovery for, for drugs and alcohol. I, I haven't, I don't use drugs or alcohol and I never have. And I don't, I don't have that lived experience. And so I, again, it's like trying to understand that is, is just really, you can't ever fully understand it. And when somebody then shares that with you and sort of then basically some, you know, sometimes, um, you know, in a, in a nice way, but kind of sort of implores you to look and, and, and to look under the, the rug here and there and to do some investigation. Um, you know, it's just, obviously I'm honored that they trust me, but it's also, it's also burdensome in some ways, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, as much as I enjoy my work, I love my work, 
uh, it's uh, it's not always kind of as <laughs> high flying and adventurous, I guess, as it sounds, because there's a lot of opposition and there's a lot, which is fine, and I that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but sometimes that opposition borders on you know some scary stuff. And I, you know, the one question that I have stumped the uh, director of NIDA, Nora Volkow, on in our many many years of talking, she cannot fully answer for me. Uh, is, you know, why is it that for some people, marijuana, not not methamphetamine, that's more addictive, not cocaine, that's more addictive, not heroin, that's more addictive, but marijuana, why does it produce zealots among some of its users? I mean, it, essentially, it, 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 there's a I call it like a religion. I mean, some some people, I mean, there's this one thing to say, well, I weighed the pros and cons. And, you know, I think that legalization is um, on, you know, it makes more sense than it doesn't, and it can be done the right way, and here's a way to do it. I mean, that's one thing. But it's a very different thing to sort of worship marijuana and think that it's wonderful and that anybody saying anything against it is essentially heretical. And, you know, I've been, um, you know, approached by some of those folks, and it can be scary sometimes. Yeah, I've been approached by them, too. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Um, so your, your focus is... In Smokescreen, uh, as opposed to your first book, which was, which was um, you know, the seven myths about marijuana, kind of about the drug itself, your focus in Smokescreen is on this new emerging, well, I mean, it's almost 10 years old, so I guess I shouldn't say it's new and emerging, but it is continuing to emerge, the industry of legalized and commercialized marijuana in both the yeah. recreational and medical sectors. And you sure. argue that this is ultimately a net negative thing. Uh, you write, Quote, what's happening in America is a silent and sanctioned epidemic of sorts, an emerging public health crisis over a drug that has been clothed stunningly in acceptability. You argue that, quote, a veneer of social justice has allowed legalization to be accepted. Explain that a bit more. What do you mean by a veneer of social justice? I mean, in a sentence, um, rich, privileged white guys that never cared about black lives all of a sudden marching on the street for civil rights because it has to be as a way to get marijuana legalization through <laughs> that's the one sentence explanation um but the you know and but the the longer explanation is that y you know you see clearly the injustice we have in our country clearly the problems we have the stain of racism that is deep in our country clearly the problems among multiple systems, whether it's criminal justice, housing, healthcare, education, opportunities, I mean, on and on, okay? I am not denying that for one minute. And I, by the way, get in trouble sometimes, believe it or not, when I say this, not that I'm saying, you know, give me a cookie, but um, it's not so, you know, in some of the conferences that I go to and others who are supporters, um, they, they don't like when I say that. Uh, but it's true. I believe it and I see it and I've seen it. And so you have the, you have that, and then you have folks. So you sort of have two kinds of folks that are talking about social justice with marijuana. One is the dominant, um, which is the dominant one is the usually pretty privileged kind of person who stands to gain financially from legalizing marijuana and is able to use social justice is able to talk about the record number of marijuana arrests or those people in prison or criminal records or housing discrimination or whatnot um, as a way to get their agenda through and say, well, that's the reason I'm pushing this. Whereas they're really pushing it because they're invested, they're making money, they, they, they see this very selfishly. And of course, there are well-meaning you know, social justice warriors who want an equal society and think that this is a huge part of it. I think they're mistaken, um, but I don't question their intentions. But those people are not the ones that have changed law and policy over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I think the one thing I agree with Alan St. Pierre, the head of normal, uh, maybe we agree on a few things, but the one, one of the things I think we definitely agree on, because he said it, uh, and I recently saw him say it again, is that this movement of uh, legalizing marijuana is, is not a I mean, sort of grassroots movement among sort of, you know, the ethnic poor of our country. Uh, and he didn't say that part. He said this part, which is that it's the three billionaires that essentially financed this in the mid 90s that, that really gave gas 
uh, to something that was languishing that you've written so eloquently about in the past. Uh, and so you had these three billionaires. You had George Soros, Peter Lewis, and John Sperling. And I almost hesitate to talk about George Soros, but you can't not talk about Soros's influence. And I hesitate it because it's become sort of this flashpoint for conservatives um, on the one end and then, you know, sort of liberals on the other from the other perspective. And it's sort of, mm -hmm. you can't talk about, it's just become so politically charged to even mention his name. So I actually like people to focus on the other folks, Peter Lewis, who essentially funded the professional movement to legalize marijuana, the, the offshoot of normal that, you know, really sort of, you know, cut their hair and put on a suit um, and became credible on the Hill, the Marijuana Policy Project, and John Sperling, who funded a lot of these initiatives as well, who made his money um, with the starting the, the largest for-profit university that our country had ever seen, University of Phoenix, and making billions of dollars that way. And, you know, sort of uh, finding marijuana in his, you know, he was a septuagenarian or so, so, and loving it. Um, and so those three old, rich, white guys who like marijuana, uh, changed this entirely. And they're responsible for where we are right now. Um, and I, I just think like, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about who's making money. We need to talk about how Cambridge, Massachusetts, a place I paid taxes in and lived in for six years and know pretty well, um, yeah, of all places. I mean, I think they voted for Barack Obama, like 94% or something like that. Uh, you know, they can't get the social justice program right when it comes to, you know, legalizing marijuana in an equitable way. I mean, they are not getting it right. Um, mm. it, it's because it's rigged from the beginning. It's because this whole thing is the same story that we've seen with alcohol, with tobacco, with pharmaceuticals, with, I mean, uh, sugar. I mean, you can name any different things. And I just think it's astounding that we think we'll get it right this time. That like we, like for some reason, we've always gotten it wrong in terms of sort of capitalism in a way that is selling a product uh, and benefiting marginalized communities that somehow we're going to get it right. I just think it's a fool's errand to try and get it right because I we're not getting it right. And um, that's, that's, wrong. that's the long answer to your question. But it was such an immensely powerful way to sway voters, Absolutely. you know, in areas where uh, legalization was on the ballot, either through initiative or through mm -hmm. the state legislature action. Right. Arguments for social justice dwarfed arguments for tax revenue, dwarfed arguments sure. for, you know, this is a drug that is less dangerous than X, Y, and Z. So talk a little bit about how, you respond to that then if if you're finding that these social justice mm -hmm. arguments are more veneer you mm -hmm. know more talk than walk and yet they remain so powerful to voters where is that disconnect coming from well i think we need to talk about and articulate how we should fix elements of the criminal justice system i mean there's not a reason why we need to have five times as many people in prison as any other industrialized country four times as many people than our historical average, um, you know, there's, there's, we, we have to talk about that seriously and have a serious conversation about incarceration and the criminal justice system. I, but we wouldn't be talking about marijuana if we had that conversation in a truthful way, because it's such a minuscule part. It's on the edge uh, in terms of, you know, affecting incarceration. Uh, it, look, it does affect um, individuals in terms of arrest records and expungements and, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe short jail stints or probation violations, all those things we should look at, but we don't have to commercialize an industry to do that. And I don't think, uh, I, I, I just don't think that that has been articulated in a way that people can understand. I mean, even today you have Thomas Massey, who's a, a libertarian Republican uh, um, voting on the um, legalization bill just a couple hours ago, talking about how, you know, people are in favor of this. They want decriminalization. And I, and I tweeted out loud and, and I don't usually tweet in caps, but I had to, cause I was so like, it just, you know, I wanted to just grab the computer and just like shake it and say, wait a minute, decriminalization is not legalization. These are two different things. Why can't we understand that? And it's often used as a veneer decrim for legalization, but in this raw, pure form, they are different things. Uh, decriminalization removes criminal penalties. We did, 12 states did so in the 1970s. We did not legalize marijuana. We did not legalize selling. And, and legalization is obviously very different. That's the alcohol and tobacco model. And 
Um, so <laughs> I just don't think that's been articulated well. And I also think that it's been taken advantage of by folks who want to get legalization through that purposefully they say, well, this is really about removing the criminal element of it. And I wish we, w- we could do that, but I'd like to stop there. I don't want to continue. And, you know, it's because basically what a lot, again, you, you, you've written a lot about this, what, you know, we heard in the late 1970s from the anti-drug activists then was that, well, wait a minute, decriminalization is going to lead to legalization. So we shouldn't be in favor of decriminalization. In some ways, I mean, that is what they're doing. They're employing, it's too bad, but they're employing those tactics. And um, also, I think it was a way to reach harder to reach black and brown communities who have suffer the consequences of drugs and actually are less inclined to want to legalize. Um, They're more skeptical of of sort of this idea of more drugs in our community. They are ravaged by alcohol, uh, you know, eight times as many liquor stores and poorer communities of color uh, in many of our cities than in upper class communities. They don't want, they already have, you know, payday loan, uh, convenience stores, lottery, alcohol, cigarettes, like they don't, they, they don't want a pot shop. They, they'd like fresh vegetables and a good school system, um, but, a, but a pot shop in their community is not a, attractive to them at all. Uh, and yet we see that that's why that argument of social justice needs to be employed, because it's really a distraction from, I think, the true consequences of legalization. And, and in the book, I highlight a few people from Compton, California, of all places, who um, really push back on that. And to this day, uh, Compton does not al- allow um, marijuana stores, um, you know, locally because of the impact in their community. You also argue that legalization is pernicious because what's being legalized today is a more high potency form of mm-hmm. cannabis, which mm-hmm. you say is, um, quote, a different drug than it was in the past, too dangerous mm-hmm. for many who consume it. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember reading Michael Pollan's Botany of Desire, Mm-hmm. in which he devotes an entire uh, entire chapter to marijuana, where he talks about this is one of the plants that human beings have invested thousands of years into cultivating in order to, mm-hmm. uh, yes. along with the apple, the potato, and I think the last one is nicotine, in order to, it, it, or no, it's sugar. Oh, God, poor Michael Pollan. I'm so sorry. I'm butchering your book right now. <laughs> But it's one of the four. Uh, yes, but we've spent thousands either. of years, you know, cultivating uh, this plant to achieve uh, higher intoxicating effects. So, yeah. why is the drug now more potent than it was before? And and which period of before are you referring to specifically? Well, we never had ninety percent THC in the nineteen eighties, and so in the very recent history, if you look at the, if you want to look at thousands and thousands of years. Absolutely. There was marijuana thousands of years ago, uh, but it was in a very different form. Even 200 years ago, there was marijuana in our country that was mainly hemp, uh, which meant it had just minuscule amounts of THC. It was a cousin of marijuana. And yet in the last 20 years, we have, you know, agriculture has come a long way in the last 20 to 30 years versus the last 3000 years. And in those last 20 to 30 years, we've been able to manipulate the marijuana plant and, and, and extract in such a way that we never had before. And we never had, by the way, mass produced, um, marketed, um, you know, branded uh, products like this. And that's thanks to legalization. That's not thanks to, you know, farmers, sort of the unwitting farmer or even Pablo Escobar, for that matter, because drug dealers never sold this. They didn't cultivate it in this way. Uh, I mean, they did a lot of other bad things, of course, but they didn't, they didn't create 99% THC. That was good old, you know, ingenuity of, of the state legalization systems. And, you know, I, I think that's really dangerous. And I think that that, you know, is not at all what Americans are accustomed to, and not what they're voting for. I mean, I have legislators to this day, Democratic legislators in state, um, different state bodies around the country, from very blue states, who have approached us and sort of like four or five over the last year and, you know, unwitting, they don't know about each other, but they've approached us and essentially said the same thing, which is that, wait a minute, I didn't know we allowed this stuff. I didn't know it legalized, you know, 90% dabs or, you know, these extracts or these elixirs or, or these ice creams. I, I didn't know that. And, and I tell you, they all voted for legalization, in their respective, you know, very blue states. Uh, and they admit that. But they, they didn't even know that. And these are like very knowledgeable, learned, smart people who are leading their state had no idea about it. And let alone the voters. I mean, 
Um, listen, if everybody had the experience and knowledge of Michael Pollan and every voter was that informed, we'll ha we would ha be having a whole different discussion about drugs in our society. But unfortunately, they're not. And people are unwittingly voting for things they don't even know about because of the strength and potency. It's not what they used to use you know, in college or high school or what they ever tried or what they've even seen unless they are sort of actively using in the last few years. And that's obviously not a majority of the population. So I, I just think we don't even know what we're legalizing half the time, more than half the time. You also argue, and this is your big thesis, that legal pot is being touted by, quote, a for-profit marijuana industry that exploits the most vulnerable. You've already touched on it a bit, but tell me more about that. Who do you mean when you say the most vulnerable? Well, the vo most vulnerable, I mean, are those that suffer the consequences of addiction more than others. And we know that that is not only genetic, that's also environmental. If you don't have a stable family, uh, if you don't have access to housing and health care and a good education, if you don't have a lot of these things, uh, we know that you're more likely to slide into, into addiction. And that's, again, why you have predatory industries targeting um, different populations that suit their needs. And they're not always uh, ethnic minority populations. I mean, the OxyContin uh, issue and Purdue Pharma and all the perniciousness that came out of pharma, um, they targeted poor white folks in West Virginia first. Why? Because they were having a lot of pain working in the coal mines, and it was a perfect uneducated population to be able to, 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 to um, you know, an under-resourced population and underserved that they could exploit. And they did. They didn't go to, they didn't go to Compton. They went to, you know, the outskirts of, of West Virginia. Uh, but the alcohol industry, tobacco industry, uh, traditionally have targeted um, the black and brown community because they have less resources, less access to resources, and they're more, they're going to be more vulnerable. And the same thing is happening with marijuana. Um, it's targeting vulnerable populations like, first of all, like young people and especially young adults who, you know, even though you're 18, your, your brain is still developing for quite a long time more. And um, they're certainly targeting that population. They're getting, getting away with it. Um, they're, there, there's more pot shops in poorer communities of color um, than in non-communities of color. We know that in places like Denver. And so they're kind of repeating that playbook all over again. And again, we've been duped by these guys before. I don't know why we'd want to be duped again. Um, you know, I don't think people realize the billions of dollars that are invested by big tobacco now in marijuana, that they see this as their alternative source. They've seen it for 50 years, by the way, as this, but you know, again, as you've documented, in the 1970s, it didn't go yeah, as far as they wanted it to go, but they were ready if it was. But um, it faded away, and then they dealt with, you know, everything that they dealt with in the 80s and 90s, and then they took the settlement, and they've been looking for alternatives ever since. Obviously, va va vaping and vaping marijuana, too, and, and just marijuana, plain old marijuana, is very, you know, it's attractive to them. And I don't think the American people know that. In fact, when we do polling about you know, if you knew legalization was supported by the tobacco industry, would you vote for legalization in your state? It's an overwhelming no. But that's not the question that voters are given. They're given, you know, do you think that adults should have the right to possess, use and sell, you know, uh, marijuana? Question mark. I mean, it's sort of <laughs> it's not really saying that sort of what's happening. It's it's it, and, you know, when you have an uninformed electorate, that that's we get what we get. And that's what we're getting right now. So you call the new marijuana industry Goliath. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that they are equipped. They are big. They're growing. It seems insurmountable at times because of the influence and, and uh, hold they have on state legislatures. Uh, it's incredible how they have been able to essentially lead and direct um, marijuana, sort of state marijuana decision-making bodies, how they've influenced the process uh, on the state level and how they are everywhere on the federal level as well. Um, and by the way, everywhere, I mean, not just marijuana companies sending their own people up to Capitol Hill, but, you know, the marijuana industry hiring the biggest lobbyists in Washington. And, and in different state capitals in order to make sure that they can't work on the anti side and that they're going to work for them. Uh, and so it feels like that. It feels like 
it's just this huge force that is um, very, very, very powerful. And it can be demoralizing at times to see how far they, you know, really how far they are. Um, so. Well, that's really interesting to me because to me, I see you in as, as one of the newest voices in a long line of mm -hmm. grassroots cannabis activists, mm -hmm. people who have been working since the 1960s to either mm -hmm. increase or limit access to this drug. Mm -hmm. And because of your location in DC and your influence in influencing or your interest in influencing Capitol Hill, you also remind me a lot of Keith Straub, who founded the pro-legalization group Normal back in 1970. You're both upset by how marijuana users are being treated and you go to Washington to voice your concerns. But back in 1970, when Normal was getting started, the Washington Post called it Washington's feeblest lobby, uh, which is a pretty <laughs> sick burn, you know, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So when I read that you see yourself fighting against a Goliath of an industry, it reminded me of that quote. And I wanted to know if you ever felt feeble in the face of this Goliath, like how the Washington Post once described Keith Straub. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, and I have no, I'm not embarrassed to say that. I mean, um, look, on the one hand, we're not feeble because we've been able to hold federal law. The president of the United States, a Democratic president, well-respected one, is firmly anti-legalization. We have most major medical associations who stand with us. And so, you know, it's... Uh, from that perspective, I don't. But from the perspective of going up against this industry when we go to Capitol Hill or when we go to, um, you know, different states and state capitals, sure, we can. We can feel uh, we can feel very feeble and, um, you know, it can be difficult. It can be, it can be very difficult, especially when we have ballot initiatives because you need, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so we, we have a feeble amount of money to, to, to counter that often. It does feel like there's been somewhat of a reversal that, that Sam today is mm -hmm. the normal of the 1970s, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. where the, the pendulum is always kind of swinging back and forth between acceptance and, um, mm -hmm. and non-acceptance. Mm -hmm. And as it's moving much further toward acceptance, all of a mm -hmm. sudden, you know, Sam is in the position of feeling feeble, whereas in 1970, 51 years ago, normal very much so was. Mm -hmm. Well, so what do you think the answer to this situation is? You've touched on it a bit before. Clearly, it's mm -hmm. not recriminalization. Mm -hmm. So what yeah, do you find the solution to be? Well, I think there is a, is a new there is a new way. There's a way where we can research marijuana's properties for both its pros and cons. There's a lot we don't know about it. Um, Again, for potential therapeutic development, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of components in it, most of which we don't know about. And but isn't that, uh, but very uh, briefly, isn't that held uh -huh. up though by its Schedule One well, position? So I would argue that not really, and there's a way around it, even if you think it is, without legalizing, it's a lot more responsible. So on that kind of quick aside, uh, I'll, I'll just go down that path for a minute. Um, there are thousands and thousands of research studies on marijuana. So sort of to say that because it's illegal, we can't research it. I mean, heroin's a schedule one and we're still researching it. Marijuana we're researching. Is it harder to research? Yes. And we actually put out a five point plan to make it easier to research. Congress has implemented three of those five points. We are still pushing it. We want there to be more research. I, we also have argued for a separate classification of marijuana. So, you know, something like a 1A where, or a 1R where you have for, for rec basically recreational use and distribution, it's illegal, but for research purposes, there are much, you know, there are better ways around it. And so it doesn't have to fit into this kind of stodgy, basket of schedule one kind of deplorable drugs we don't want to ever look at or imagine um, that there are ways around that. And I don't think legalizing is, we, we wouldn't legalize heroin because we want to research it. We would find a way to research it. And we are finding ways to research it uh, in ways that's res that are responsible. So I think that's just on that aside. But anyway, let's research it. Let's look at the negative aspects. We don't know what 99%, 90, 60, 50, 40, 20% THC is doing to the developing brain, to adult brains, to senior brains that are suffering from, uh, you know, dementia and other issues that can be negative for that. What, what do we know? We need to learn a lot more about it. So I'd like to do that. 
Uh, I'd like there to be, uh, in a sense, no criminal penalties for low level use. I see it as speeding. You know, some people, by the way, will speed and get away with it their whole life and be fine. Good. Good for them. But we don't get rid of speed limits because a certain percentage of the population is able to drive over them and be fine. So I see marijuana laws in a similar way. We should move to discourage. And how do we discourage? Well, we don't need to have overkill and have mandatory minimums and ruin someone's life for making a mistake. Absolutely not. But we also shouldn't pretend to be able to discourage while allowing an industry to essentially have free reign. And, you know, with cigarettes, cigarettes are legal, but we've been able to discourage them. Um, But that has been in the environment of extreme stigma towards tobacco. We're in the opposite environment, like you mentioned, for marijuana with the ascendancy of the popularity and promotion. Even Ethan Nadelman recently on a podcast admitted that he's not sure he likes to see the glorification of marijuana, even though he basically created that, which I thought was a fascinating comment that he said that. Um, but that's where we are with marijuana. We are such an, an extreme. And I and I think maybe you, you were going here with kind of this idea of ebbs and flows of popularity. I don't think it's going to last forever, the popularity, but I think it's going to get more popular before it gets unpopular, uh, unless there was some major tragedy that happened, which, God forbid, could happen, that that could reverse things tomorrow. But I, I you know, sort of say that, say for that, which we don't want to happen, obviously, I think that um, we haven't reached the popularity, but when we do, there's going to be a backlash. I already feel different quarters under, when, when CNN is now publishing stories on cannabis hypermesis syndrome, which is uncontrollable vomiting, and Instagram um, influencers are talking that about, why don't we know more about hyperemesis? It's a huge issue. Uh, that was unfathomable three years ago. So, you know, things I think will come to light, but it's going to take more time. And, and I think your normal comparison is, I probably agree with it, 75%. I mean, again, normal, when they started, they didn't have support from the president. They didn't have you know, most of Congress on their side, they didn't have all this, but yes, they were, they were, it was an increasingly unpopular idea. They were kind of saying something that had not been said. So I I think there's, there's some similarities, but there are probably some differences there too. I just wanted to mention. So ultimately smokescreen argues uh, in favor of decriminalization rather than legalization. Explain what you mean by that and what the differences uh, between these two outcomes are. Right. Well, for decriminalization, you remove criminal penalties. You could still have civil penalties depending on the jurisdiction. And I think, you know, local jurisdictions can decide that. I mean, um, you know, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee may be different than San Francisco, California. So I, you know, we have to understand that there is some variation there. We've often had variation up to a point of drug policy, most drug policies at the state and local level anyway. Um, but what I wouldn't do is legalize the use, sale, and production because that becomes a much more interstate issue. It's not just one state. It doesn't just affect one state, as we've seen with Colorado and the effects on Wyoming and other places that have not legalized um, in terms of them getting marijuana in much you know, more you know, in an easier way and, uh, and across their state borders. So clearly, when you legalize the production, you're talking about something that really needs to be federal. Uh, and so I would not do that. Um, Legalization allows for the production, sales, marketing. And again, in this country, it is equivalent to the commercialization. I've heard a lot of people say, well, why can't we legalize in a non-commercialized way? Well, my answer is, why can't we be like Sweden or Finland or, you know, Uruguay? I mean, we're not those countries. So doing that anytime soon is not happening, especially, by the way, if you want bipartisan support for legalization. So, um, you know, I think that legalization puts us in, we get so many of the cons and not enough pros uh, if we're trying to reform policy. Whereas decriminalization, if it can be done in the right way, I also don't agree with all stripes of decriminalization, but if we can, if we can do it in a way that discourages use, but also protects, you know, human rights and social justice and doesn't saddle people with a criminal record for making a mistake, um, that's, that I think is, is, is wiser, but it's a very fine line. And you know, I, I've had people say, well, Kevin, why are you advocating for decriminalization? Because the minute you give that, they're going to take it to legalization. And that's 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 maybe true. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, it didn't happen in the 1970s. We had decriminalization in a dozen states. It, did, it took a long time for 
legalization to happen. But I don't know. I think that's a legitimate question. Uh, but I do think there are reforms we can make. Uh, and, you know, I'm in favor of those. So what has the reaction to smokescreen been like? You know, I think it's been mixed, if I'm to be honest. I think that, you know, I've gotten emails and calls from people in the Obama administration, um, people in the Bush administration. I mean, sort of, and I, I say that to distinguish from the sort of Trump stripe of, of Republicanism, um, who have said, you know, thank you for writing this. I'm distributing it to my community or just, you know, I'm giving it to my son who really needs to read it, who doesn't understand what's going on with marijuana. Um, so that's been good. Um, it's sold really well, actually. Um, but f as far as critical review, it's interesting. I have been interviewed by about two or three major publications, um, you know, major legacy media organizations uh, about the book, lengthy interviews, and nothing has been published by them on the book. And I don't know if it's because I'm not answering the questions in the way that they would like to present the story as either somebody who feels, you know, despondent because I'm, I'm not despondent um patrick once called me you know a happy warrior which i think i am uh and or if they want me to sort of think that this is just you know un over you know this is, can't be overcome what's happening with marijuana or they just didn't like what i had to say about the harms i don't know why or maybe it was just there wasn't enough space on the page i don't know but um so that's been to be honest that's been disappointing um but overall uh, you know, it's, it's in over 20,000 hands across the country, book clubs and things happening and talking about it. I, I'm really happy about it. So normally on this channel, my last question is about the project you're working on next and what we can expect to hear from you. But actually, I'm going to change it up slightly based on this conversation. I'd like to ask instead, do you see cannabis policy remaining your focus for the, you know, the foreseeable future, or do you see yourself uh, expanding uh, your scope of activism and influence? You know, I'm certainly thinking about the decriminalization of psychedelics here in D.C. and elsewhere, uh, the decriminalization of nearly all uh, illicit drug possession will no longer illicit, right, in places like Oregon. Do you see yourself staying focused on cannabis or do you see yourself moving out to some of these other realms where decriminalization and potentially legalization are also moving toward? Well, I've long been interested in all drugs. I sort of have put myself in this corner uh, niche of marijuana basically because no one else was doing it and no one else was putting forward uh, a sensible position that was swaying people. You know, I, I, I can tell you the most gratifying part of my job is something I you know, used to hear a lot on airplanes when I was flying before the pandemic or from other people, from friends or, or colleagues or just strangers at parties who basically started out the conversation inclined to be in favor of legalization. And then 10 minutes later or an hour later, or two minutes later, basically told me very genuinely that either I changed their mind or, or gave them a lot to think about that they had never considered. There's nothing more gratifying than that. And it's been wonderful and it will continue to be wonderful to talk about this. And this is a very, you know, complex issue of marijuana. There's so many different parts, Delta eight now, all these different things. But, um, you know, my, my, PhD, half my dissertation at Oxford was about you know, heroin addicts in Baltimore uh, and the effectiveness of interventions there. I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was focused on club drugs in the late 90s when I was a college student. So I've always been interested in substance use generally. It's just in the last 10 years, I've kind of been in this corner. Um, I think I think in the future, marijuana will remain a focus, but not the only one. I am eager to talk about other drugs, not only in the context of legalization, then it's definitely happening where I think we're moving towards pushes for the legalization of all drugs, not just decriminalization. Um, but more about, you know, what are positive things that are happening around the country that can be scaled up? Because we do know what can work to help people with addiction. We do know what can work to prevent most people or increase the chance of people going down the path of, of, uh, down the path towards addiction. And, um, I'm eager to talk about those things, especially in the climate where I feel like we either are talking about, you know, cracking down on people or, you know, having a space for them to inject government supplied heroin. I think there are better, um, solutions in either of those two extremes that we can employ that we're not doing, but they're happening in little pockets around the country. And I'm really, interested in finding those 
pockets and, you know, figuring out how much is culture, how much can be adapted, how much can't be adapted, how much can be transferred and scaling up those things that work. And I don't see a unified drug policy voice talking about drug policy solutions. Uh, and I'm very interested in doing that. So um, doesn't mean that I, you know, if I do that, I'm not going to be talking about marijuana. I think I always will. I don't, I, I think no matter what happens, this is going to be a part of me. It's something I'm passionate about. But I'm also, and I've always been interested in looking at other drugs too, both in the context of the legal changes you're talking about, but also in the context of, you know, what can we do? What things can work um, to make people's lives and communities uh, better and safer? Well, Kevin, we've taken up a lot of your time, but I really want to thank you for coming on the New Books Network and talking about Smokescreen with us today. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Emily.